Hello, esteemed listeners from the Far. Sasha here, your intrepid guide to all things peculiar London. Welcome back to another Riddlefield episode of London Ask and Answered. Now, as I was strolling through Hyde Park the other day, dodging pigeons and contemplating the many mysteries of our city, like why does it rain every time I forget my umbrella, but stay sunny when I've lugged it around all day, I had an epiphany. London with all its quirks and quibbles is an endless treasure trove of tales. Today's episode is particularly exciting as we'll navigate the intricate maze that is White Chapel. Imagine a place with more layers than my Aunt Erna's notorious seven-layer dip. From ghost tales that have less to do with eerie booths and more with intriguing historical who's to the frequent bylines of Brick Lane that could tempt even the strictest of diet followers into a culinary indulgence. Whitechapel is a delightful enigma waiting to be explored. But wait, there's more. In my quest to decode London, I'll also be diving deep into my mailbag, fishing out four burning questions from you, my brilliant audience. Will I have all the answers? Well, there's only one way to find out. This episode promises to be a roller coaster of revelations and rip-tickling anecdotes. So, whether you're tuning in from a cozy London flat, an overcrowded tube, bless you rush our listeners, or from the other side of the world. Brace yourself for a journey that promises twists and turns, more bewildering than a roundabout in the square mile. Welcome to London Ask and Answered. London, a city celebrated with its rich history and cultural diversity, is a mosaic of stories waiting to be told. Among its many boroughs, the East End and Whitechapel are the most enigmatic, teeming with tales of yore and echoes of the past. To unravel its mysteries, we embark on a historic journey. Chapter 1 – The Landscape of Memories The East End was only sometimes a vibrant culture hub it is today. In Victorian London, it was synonymous with poverty, overpopulation and squalor. Its transformation into today's multicultural nucleus is nothing short of remarkable. The narrow cobblestone streets, which once echoed with the sounds of horse-drawn carriages, now resound with the lively shadow of diverse communities of the melodies of modern life. During the Victorian era, the East End stood in stark contrast to the affluence and grandeur of other parts of London. Cobblestone streets, often dimly lit by gas lamps, were lined with row houses, many of which were overcrowded due to rapid urbanization. The alleys echoed with the sounds of horse-drawn carriages, street vendors peddling their wares and children playing. The East End became a reflection of the socio-economic disparities of the time. While neighborhoods like Mayfair and Kensington bragged opulent mansions and manicured gardens, the East End was densely populated, often with families cramped into small living spaces. It became the living quarters for many of London's working class, who toiled in the city's factories, docks and markets. With rapid urbanization came a multitude of challenges. The East End grappled with issues like sanitation, access to clean water and public health concerns. Outbreaks of diseases such as cholera were not uncommon. The area's infrastructure struggled to keep up with the burgeoning population, leading to the establishment of many charitable organizations aiming to provide relief. Despite its challenges, the East End was a hive of cultural activity. Music halls, pubs and theatres dotted the landscape, offering respite and entertainment to its residents. Places like Wilton's Music Hall, which still stands today, were a testament to the area's vibrant art scene. Even in those early days, the seeds of change were being sown. 
Visionaries and philanthropists began initiatives to improve living conditions. Schools, hospitals and public bars started to emerge, aiming to uplift the community. The spirit of resilience and the community tight-knit fabric laid the foundation for the East End's eventual transformation into the multicultural hub it is today. Chapter 2 – Whitechapel's Humble Beginnings Tracing back to the 1700s, Whitechapel's transformation was humble. Once a serene rural hamlet, its landscape began to shift dramatically as the tendrils of urbanization reached its borders. Fields gave way to factories and the skyline was soon punctuated with chimneys belching smoke. Whitechapel was an idyllic and serene rural hamlet in its earliest days. Rolling meadows, flourishing orchards and gentle streams painted a picturesque landscape. Residents of this hamlet led simple lives, relying predominantly on agriculture, with farmers tending to their crops and livestock. The air was filled with chirping of birds and the distant sound of farm animals. Whitechapel's name is believed to have originated from a small chapel of ease dedicated to St. Mary. Constructed in the 13th century, this chapel was distinguished by its white stone, a rarity at the time, setting it apart from other buildings. Over time, the chapel's surrounding area became known as Whitechapel. As the city of London expanded, Whitechapel's strategic location made it a key thoroughfare. The Whitechapel High Street, which still exists today, became a vital road connecting the city of London to the eastern parts of England. This increased accessibility and connectivity began drawing merchants, traders and travelers to the area. By the 16th and 17th century, the tendrils of urbanization began to creep into Whitechapel. The once sparse hamlet saw an influx of settlers, drawn by its proximity to London's core. Gradually, open fields gave way to marketplaces, houses and inns. Whitechapel's character began to shift from rural to urban. With urbanization came industrialization. The 18th century saw the rise of breweries, tanneries and foundries in Whitechapel. The area economy began to diversify, reducing its reliance on agriculture. The once quiet hamlet now buzzed with the sounds of machinery, commerce and a rapidly growing populace. As the population grew, so did the challenges. Whitechapel's rapid growth wasn't always organized, leading to overcrowded housing and inadequate infrastructure. Additionally, its transformation into a commercial and industrial hub attracted a diverse group of settlers, each bringing their own customs, beliefs and practices. This diversity, while enriching, also posed challenges of integration and cohesion. Chapter 3 – The Shadows of Whitechapel As Whitechapel evolved into a bustling urban area, it inevitably developed a darker side. The overcrowded and often unsanitary living conditions, coupled with the challenges of rapid urbanization, gave rise to an environment where crime and vice found fertile ground. As the 19th century progressed, Whitechapel became home to many DOS houses or common lodging houses. These establishments provided cheap accommodation for the transient population, including sailors, internal workers and others without permanent residence. Often overcrowded and poorly maintained, these DOS houses became hotbeds for theft, violence and other illicited activities. The late 1880s saw a series of gruesome murders that sent shockwaves through London and beyond. The killings, characterized by their brutality and the mysterious circumstances surrounding them, were attributed to an unidentified assailant who later became infamously known as Jack the Ripper. The inability of the police to apprehend the perpetrator despite massive efforts added to the growing atmosphere of fear and suspicion. The Ripper's crimes were not just a police matter, they became a media sensation. Newspapers of the day were filled with graphic details, speculations and theories about the identity and motives of the killer. This relentless coverage, while heightening public anxiety, also cast a spotlight on the living conditions and challenges faced by Whitechapel's residents. 
The intense scrutiny brought about by the Ripper cases led to a growing awareness and acknowledgement to the social issues plaguing Whitechapel. Various reform movements arose, aiming to address problems like housing, sanitation and public health. While the murders were undoubtedly a dark chapter in Whitechapel's history, they inadvertently catalyzed efforts to improve the quality of life for its residents. While the Ripper cases dominate discussions about Whitechapel's dark past, it's essential to recognize that the area witnessed other significant events and challenges during this period. Strikes, political movements and social reforms were all part of the tapestry that shaped Whitechapel's complex history. Chapter 4 – A Melting Pot of Cultures Whitechapel's rich tapestry is woven with threads from across the globe, from the Jewish diaspora seeking refuge from persecution to South Asian immigrants bringing their vibrant cultures and traditions. The area became a melting pot of ethnicities, traditions and stories. This blend is evident in the myriad of eateries, shops and cultural centers that dot the landscape. Over the centuries, Whitechapel's strategic location, combined with its evolving socio-economic landscape, made it a magnet for various immigrant communities. These groups, seeking refuge, opportunity or simply a new beginning, found a home in the heart of East London. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Whitechapel became a sanctuary for Jewish immigrants fleeing pogroms and persecution in Eastern Europe. They brought with them rich traditions, Yiddish theatre, kosher delis and synagogues, which became an integral part of Whitechapel's cultural fabric. Brick Lane's iconic Bagel Bake is a testament to this legacy. Post-World War II, a significant influx of immigrants from South Asia, particularly Bangladesh, settled in Whitechapel. They introduced vibrant textiles, aromatic spices and a culinary revolution that turned Brick Lane into the curry capital of London. The Anyone Boishkashi Mela festival celebrating the Bengali New Year showcases the community's rich cultural heritage. Whitechapel's diversity doesn't end there. Throughout the 20th century, waves of Irish and Caribbean immigrants added their unique flavors to the area's cultural stew. Pubs offering traditional Irish music stood alongside venues pulsating with reggae beats, symbolizing Whitechapel's harmonious blend of traditions. While the merging of cultures enriched Whitechapel, it wasn't without challenges. Differences in traditions, beliefs and practices often led to tensions. However, over time a mutual appreciation and respect for diverse cultures emerged. The area became a symbol of London's multicultural spirit. The confluence of cultures in Whitechapel gave birth to a unique artistic movement. Galleries, street art, music venues and theatres began to reflect the area's diverse influences. From traditional folk performances to avant-garde exhibitions, Whitechapel became a canvas where artists from various backgrounds expressed their narratives. Chapter 5 – The Artistic and Culinary Heartbeat The fusion of cultures birthed an explosion of artistic and culinary delights. Galleries showcasing art that transcends borders, restaurants serving dishes that are a confluence of flavors from across the globe and music venues where the rhythm of the world came together. The late 20th century saw Whitechapel emerging as a haven for artists, poets and musicians. Attracted by its rich history and cultural diversity, many bohemian souls flocked to the area, transforming dilapidated warehouses into studios and galleries. The artistic influx laid the foundation for Whitechapel's vibrant art scene. An institution in its own right, the Whitechapel Gallery, founded in 1901, has been at the forefront of the contemporary art in London. Hosting works by legends such as Picasso, Pollock and Hockney, this gallery became a beacon for art enthusiasts. The streets of Whitechapel are a gastronomic delight. From the aromatic curry houses of Brick Lane to the traditional pie and bash shops, the area offers a culinary journey like no other. 
The blending of culinary traditions from Eastern Europe, South Asia, the Caribbean and other parts of the world created a unique fusion cuisine that's distinctly Whitechapelian. Whitechapel breaks a rich performing arts scene beyond the visual arts and culinary delights. Venues like the Wilton's Music Hall, the world's oldest surviving music hall, hosts many performances, from traditional plays to contemporary acts. The fusion of global musical traditions can be experienced in the area's various pubs and clubs, offering everything from jazz and blues to bangra and reggae. Whitechapel streets have become a canvas for urban artists. The area is adorned with murals, graffiti and installations that reflect its multicultural spirit and socio-political undertones. Artists like Banksy have left their mark here, turning ordinary walls into thought-provoking masterpieces. The market of Whitechapel, like the Petticoat Lane Market, are a microcosm of its cultural blend. Stalls selling vintage clothing stand alongside those offering exotic spices. Antique dealers haggle with customers while food trucks serve global delicacies, encapsulating Whitechapel's essence in every corner. Over the years, Whitechapel has been home to or influenced by several notable personalities, from writers like Jack London, who chronicled the area's living conditions in The People of the Abyss, to recent artists drawing inspiration from its streets. Whitechapel's cultural and artistic legacy has been shaped by many. Chapter 6 Modern Whitechapel – A Symphony of the Old and the New Today's Whitechapel is a harmonious blend of the old and the new. Historic buildings stand tall, their walls bearing witness to centuries of change, while modern establishments buzz with contemporary energy. From legendary figures who once walked the streets to the modern-day heroes, shaping Whitechapel's future. One of the defining features of modern Whitechapel is its eclectic mix of architectural styles. Historic Victorian buildings coexist with modern glass and steel structures. The juxtaposition is not just a testament to Whitechapel's evolving skyline, but also symbolizes its ability to honor its past while embracing the future. An iconic institution, the Royal London Hospital, has been serving the community since the 18th century. Its recent modernization and expansion reflect Whitechapel's commitment to progress while ensuring the continuity of its legacy services. The presence of institutions like Queen Mary University of London underscores Whitechapel's position as the hub of education and research. The university's Blizzard Institute is at, at the forefront of medical research, further solidifying Whitechapel's reputation in the academic and scientific community. Whitechapel's transport infrastructure has seen significant upgrades in recent years. The Crossrail project, set to revolutionize London's transport network, has a significant station in Whitechapel, ensuring the area remains well-connected and accessible. Amidst its urban landscape, Whitechapel has made concerted efforts to promote sustainability. Creating and maintaining green spaces, community gardens and endeavors like pedestrian zones reflect a commitment to environmental well-being and community health. Modern Whitechapel is a hub of activity, with various festivals, parades and events celebrating its multicultural heritage. From the annual Bokashi Mela to art exhibitions, food festivals and music concerts, there's always something happening in Whitechapel that celebrates its diverse and inclusive spirit. Several projects aimed at revitalizing and rejuvenating Whitechapel have been initiated over the years. These include the restoration of historic buildings, the development of affordable housing and the creation of community centers. Such projects ensure that while Whitechapel evolves, it remains inclusive and accessible to all its residents. As with many parts of modern London, Whitechapel has embraced technology. From tech startups setting up shop in the area to the integration of smart technologies in urban planning and public services, Whitechapel is at the intersection of history and innovation. 
Whitechapel, with its cobbled streets and diverse populace, is more than just a district in London. It is a living testament to the city's ever-evolving narrative. As you journey through its lanes, you will be transported across centuries, from its humble beginnings as a rural hamlet to its current status as a vibrant urban hub. The whispers of the past are ever present in Whitechapel. Every brick, every alley has a story to tell. Of hardship faced, communities coming together, cultures merging and an indomitable spirit that refuses to be subdued. The tales of Jack the Ripper, while casting a shadow, are but one chapter in Whitechapel's vast chronicle. From the Jewish diaspora to the South Asian influx, from the artistic bohemians to the modern tech entrepreneurs, Whitechapel has welcomed all, assimilating their stories into its rich mosaic. But Whitechapel is not a relic of the past. It pulsates with contemporary energy. The old and the new coexist harmoniously here. Historic buildings house modern enterprises, traditional eateries stand alongside trendy cafes, and age-old traditions are celebrated with the same fervor as contemporary festivals. The seamless blend of epochs is what sets Whitechapel apart. Moreover, Whitechapel's story is one of resilience and rejuvenation. Despite facing numerous challenges over the years, socio-economic disparities, health crises and the pressures of rapid urbanization, it has continually reinvented itself. Today, as it stands as the crossroads of history and modernity, Whitechapel is a beacon of hope, showcasing the possibilities when communities come together, honoring the past while forging ahead into the future. To understand Whitechapel is to understand London itself. It embodies the city's spirit, diversity, challenges and triumphs. One sentiment echoed loudly. Whitechapel, with its intricate blend of tales, traditions and transformations, is truly the heartbeat of London. So what can you do and see in Whitechapel? The area is now dominated by street art, with walls and buildings serving as canvases for local and international artists. The nomadic community garden and the streets around Village Underground are particularly rich in street art. Food enthusiasts will be delighted by Whitechapel street food scene. The multicultural heritage of the area is evident in the variety of cuisines available, especially on Brick Lane. The Brick Lane Food Hall, open every weekend, offers many choices from different cuisines. Additionally, Brick Lane is renowned for its Indian restaurants, with establishments like Brick Lane Brasserie and City Spice standing out. For those interested in shopping, Whitechapel offers a unique experience. Instead of the usual high street chains, the area boasts boutique and vintage clothing shops. The Old Truman Brewery is a good starting point for those exploring the best boutiques and vintage shops. Box Park, a shopping center made out of refitted shipping containers, and the historic Old Spitalfields Market are other must-visit shopping destinations. Whitechapel Gallery stands out as one of the area's premier cultural institutions. Established in 1901, the gallery showcases a mix of local artists, artists from disadvantaged backgrounds and occasionally big names in the art world. For a touch of nature in the city, Spitalfields Farms offers a refreshing experience. Established in 1978, the farm has plots growing crops and houses various animals. The nomadic community garden, on the other hand, is an organic community where members have created spaces using found objects, making it a blend of an art gallery, farm, cafe and performance space. Whitechapel's history is best explored through its landmarks. Christchurch Spitalfields, built between 1714 and 1729, is a testament to the grandeur of Anglic architecture. Another intriguing site is Dennis Siva's house, a Georgian terrace turned into a time capsule by its former resident Dennis Sievers. Each room in the house recreates a different time period, offering a glimpse into life in Whitechapel across various eras. For those interested in the darker side of Whitechapel's history, Jack the Ripper tours provide insights into the life and crimes of the notorious serial killer. 
Whitechapel, with its blend of history, art and modern culture, offers a unique experience for visitors. Whether you're an art enthusiast, a foodie, a history buff or a shopper, Whitechapel has something for everyone. And now it's time for your questions. Let's see what the mailman has brought me. Norman asks, Hi, me and my brother are visiting London in November. And this time we have been playing with the idea to maybe take a day trip to one of all the quaint little villages that are outside London. Do you have any suggestions? Preferable no more than one hour by train from central London. It sounds like a delightful plan, Norman. Exploring the picturesque villages near London can provide a peaceful and charming experience away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Here are a few suggestions for quaint villages you could visit within about an hour's train ride from central London. First up we have Ray, East Sussex. Ray is a medieval village that offers coupled streets, historic buildings and a beautiful countryside. It's a little over an hour by train from London. On number two, we have Henley-on-Thames, Oxfordshire. Known for its annual royal regatta, Henley-on-Thames is a beautiful riverside market town. It's around an hour's train journey from London. On number three, we have Marlow in Buckinghamshire. Marlow is a charming town located along the River Thames, known for its scenic views and historic landmarks. It's about an hour and a half by train from London. On number four, we have St. Albans in Herefordshire. St. Albans features a stunning cathedral, an old world charm. It's less than a half hour's train ride from London, making it a very convenient day trip. On number five, we have Whistable in Kent. Whistable is known for its oysters, pebble beaches and quaint harbour. It's a bit over an hour's train journey from London. And on number six, we have Emerson in Buckinghamshire. Emerson is a picturesque market town with historic buildings and lovely scenery. It's less than an hour by train from London. Each of these villages has its unique charm and attractions, so you might want to choose based on your interests, whether it's history, nature or experience the local culture. It would be advisable to check the train schedules and any travel advisories before planning your visit to ensure a smooth day trip experience. Henriette asks, I booked at the Apex Temple Court because they offered one night free and free breakfast. But now I'm having second thoughts. The Hotel Rui Plaza is a bit more expensive but also offers breakfast. Is that a better location for some basic sightseeing? Well, let me throw in my five cents. <laughs> Both the Apex Temple Court Hotel and the Rui Plaza are centrally located in London, making them convenient bases for the sightseeing. Here's a brief comparison of the two in terms of location and proximity to major attractions. Let's start with the Apex Temple Court Hotel. The hotel is situated near Fleet Street, a historic area of London. It's close to several iconic landmarks such as St. Paul's Cathedral, the Royal Courts of Justice and the London Eye. The location also provides easy access to the River Thames, where you can enjoy riverside walks or cruises. The nearby Temple and Blackfriar stations offer good connectivity to other parts of the city. The Hotel Rio Plaza, located near Altgate, this hotel is also centrally positioned and close to the Tower of London, Tower Bridge and the historic financial district. It's also near the trendy neighborhoods of Shoreditch and Brick Lane, known for their vibrant nightlife and eclectic dining scene. Altgate and Altgate East tube stations are nearby providing easy access to London's extensive underground network. In terms of basic sightseeing, both hotels offer a good location. Your choice might come down to personal preferences, such as the specific attractions you wish to visit, the ambience of the surrounding neighborhood or the amenities offered by the hotels. Additionally, it's a good idea to consider the current guest reviews and ratings for both hotels, as these can provide insight into the quality of service, cleanliness and overall guest satisfaction. 
Natasha asks, how much spending money would I need for three nights in London? Also traveling to Germany, France and Austria. What sort of money would you allow for four weeks away? The amount of spending money you need can vary widely based on your travel style, the activities you plan to do and the countries you're visiting. However, I can provide some rough estimates to help you plan your budget. Let's start with three nights in London. London can be quite expensive. For a mid-range traveler, you might spend around 150 to 200 pounds per day. This would cover a moderate hotel, meals, public transportation and admission to some paid attractions. The other countries. The cost can vary significantly depending on the countries you are visiting. A mid-range daily budget in Western Europe might be around 100 to 200 euros. Here's a more detailed breakdown. Let's start with accommodations. Your budget. Hostels or budget hotels might cost anywhere from 20 euros to 80 euros per night. Mid-range hostels or Airbnb rentals might cost anywhere from 80 euros to 150 per night. And luxurious hotels or upscale rentals might cost about 150 euros and up per night. For food. You might spend 10 to 30 euros per day on food by eating at cheaper restaurants or preparing your own meals. A daily food budget of 30 to 60 euros could afford you meals at a mix of inexpensive and mid-range restaurants. And if you plan to dine at finer restaurants, you might spend around 60 euros and up per day. Let's talk about transportation. Public transportation is usually the most economical choice and can cost around 5 to 20 euros per day depending on the city. Taxis, ride shares or car rentals will cost much, much more. Then we have the activities and the sightseeing spots. Admission fees to attractions can add up. Budget anywhere from 10 euros to 100 euros per day depending on your plans. And don't forget to budget for shopping, souvenirs and unexpected expenses. Add an additional 10 to 50 euros per day could cover those costs. It's wise to research the cost of living and typical tourist expenses in each of the countries you'll be visiting. Have a great trip! Bea asks, I will be visiting London for 10 days. Should I get a hotel in different locations or just a room and use public transportation or walk around London? A 10-day trip to London sounds exciting. Whether to stay in one location or multiple locations can depend on your personal preferences and the experience you want to have. Here are some of my considerations for each option. So let's start with staying in one location. It's convenient. Having a single base can be more convenient. You won't need to pack, unpack and check in and check out multiple times. You might find better rates for longer stays. Additionally, you can save on transportation costs to and from different accommodations. Staying in one area allows you to become familiar with the local neighborhood. London has an extensive public transport system, including buses and the tube, which can take you to different parts of the city easily. And then let's take a look at staying in multiple locations. Staying in different neighborhoods can provide diverse experiences and a broader view of the city. Being close to different attractions on different days might save some travel time each day. It can be an adventure to explore different parts of London, each with its unique character and charm. But also it comes with a price, so switching hotels here and there might come down on your budget. And then let's say, well, we mixed it up and put everything together. You could also consider a mixed approach, where you stay in one location for a part of your trip and in another location for the rest. This could give you a balanced experience of both convenience and exploration. But have in mind, utilizing public transportation or walking is a great way to explore London. The Oyster card or a contactless payment card can be a cost-effective way to pay for travel on public transportation in London. 
London is a walkable city with many attractions located fairly close to each other. Walking can be a delightful way to discover the city at a leisurely pace. Consider the types of accommodations available such as hotels, hostels or vacation rentals like Airbnb which might offer different experience and price points. Ultimately, the right choice depends on your personal preferences, budget and the pace at which you'd like to travel. It might be helpful to list down the attractions you want to visit and plan your accommodations in a way that maximizes your time and convenience. But I believe in you that you will find the right one. If you have any more questions about it, you can reach out to me at hello at londonars.com and I will assist you in planning your trip. Well, folks, as we wrap up another whirlwind episode of London Ask and Answered, I must say today's deep dive into why Chapel has left me more tangled than a plate of spaghetti. But before we bid adieu, remember if you got questions bubbling up about London, whether it's about those pesky pigeons in Trafalgar Square or why the Tower Bridge isn't actually named London Bridge, despite what the catchy nursery rhyme says, I want to hear them. Slide into my WhatsApp at 0044 7700 or shoot an email over to hello at londonars.com. If you are more a typist than a texter, hop onto my website londonars.com slash ask and drop your queries there. Remember, no question is too quirky or too quintessential, so keep them coming. Now, for all you lovely listeners who want to dive even deeper into the heart of London, guess what? Yours truly has penned a book. That's right. Grab your copy of London Ask and Answer, your comprehensive travel guide to the big smoke. The ebook is a steal at just $9.99. And for those who prefer the touch of crisp pages, I've got the paperback version ready to roll. For more London Larks and Laughs, don't forget to follow me at London Ask on social media. And if you're craving some company with fellow London enthusiasts, join my Facebook group by the same name. I promise it will be bustling and brilliant as Oxford Street during the holidays. And now a quick anecdote before we part. Did you know that London buses were not always red? The distinctive crimson hue was chosen purely because it stood out. Just goes to show always dare to be different. Just like our wonderful city. Till we meet again in my next episode. Cheerio! Cheerio!